Okay, good morning. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and have to read this because there's so much here to say to introduce Dr. Breitbart. I, I don't want to leave out anything. So it's, um, uh, I have the pleasure and honor of introducing Dr. William Breitbart, who's our distinguished visiting lecturer today. And um, Dr. Breitbart is chairman, the Jimmy C. Holland. Oh, I can't see if you turn off the lights. <laughs> Can you turn the lights back on? Yeah, thanks. The Jimmy C. Holland Chair in Psychiatric Oncology and attending psychiatrist, psychiatry service in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, New York. Dr. Breitbart is also attending psychiatrist, supportive care service, Department of Medicine at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and professor of clinical psychiatry at Weill Cornell Medical College. Uh, can we call you a sister institution named Weill? So, Dr. Breitbart's research efforts have focused on psychiatric aspects of cancer and palliative care and have included studies of interventions for anxiety, depression, desire for death, and delirium in cancer and AIDS patients. Other research efforts include investigating the neuropsychiatric problems of cancer and AIDS patients, including pain, fatigue, and other symptoms. Most recently, Dr. Breitbart has studied cytokine mediators of depression and pancreatic cancer patients and has developed novel psychotherapy interventions aimed at sustaining meaning and improving spiritual well-being in the terminally ill, which you'll talk to us today about. Dr. Breitbart has published extensively on the psychiatric complications of cancer and AIDS with 200 peer review publications and over 200 chapters, review papers, and editorials. In addition, uh, Dr. Breitbart has edited or written 12 textbooks, including um, many that you know of. Uh, Dr. Breitbart also helped found IPOS Press, the publications arm of the International Psycho-Oncology Society, and authored the IPOS Press Oxford University Press text, Psychosocial Palliative Care. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Breitbart. <laughs> Uh, good morning. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Good, okay. Uh, I have a very complex multimedia presentation, so I was very anxious before the talk, making sure everything was working correctly, and I hope we don't have too many snafus. Um, thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's really uh, a pleasure to be back in... Uh, in San Francisco, and uh, uh, I, I was recalling as uh, as I was being uh, guided through the hallways, I came in through Langley Porter. I, I did a uh, a month clerkship in psychiatry, in pediatric psychiatry at Langley Porter when I was a medical student, and uh, that was uh, more than more than at least 15 years ago, and. Uh, and I, I didn't recognize anything. It was really scary. I didn't recognize anything. Uh, I also uh, made the mistake of looking up the website because I, I wasn't 100% sure that I had the title of my Grand Rounds lecture correct. Uh, so I, I, looked at, I looked up on your website uh, to see what the, whether maybe there'd be a Grand Rounds schedule. But ha and there is. You have great websites. And uh, so I, I noticed two things. I noticed that I probably should be talking about the neuroscience of meaning centered psychotherapy. But then I also noticed that last month you had Eric Kandel here. Is that right? Uh, uh, so uh, I kind of, as a result of that, I kind of feel like the, uh, the act. Uh, does anyone remember the Ed Sullivan show? <laughs> okay, right. I kind of feel like the act that followed the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show, you know what I'm saying? Does anybody know the name of the act that followed the... Uh, it was uh, Senor Wences and Topo Gijo the Mouse. That's right. And, and, and I kid you not. Very coincidentally, my very first day as a fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering, I got assigned to be uh, the psychiatrist for our supportive care, home care program, 
Uh, we provide the psychiatric supportive services in the home for patients who are too ill to get into the uh, clinic. Uh, and my very first patient was, uh, I went with uh, Nessa Coyle, who's quite a famous uh, nurse in hospice care. Uh, I went with Nessa to visit uh, the, the home of Senor Wences. And, and we walked in, and Senor Wences was actively, actively dying, and he was trying to say something. And I, I bent down close to his ear, and I said, yes, Senor Wences, did you want to say something? And he said to me, so I so, uh, you don't think that happened, huh? <laughs> we were living in a Trumpian world. Anything is possible. <laughs> okay. So, so today, <laughs> Senor Wences, yes, so the act of So today I'm going to t uh, tell you uh, the story of a, uh, of a meeting center of psychotherapy. Uh, I grew up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Anyone else? You did. What's, do you know where? Avenue and A Street. I grew up a little bit further down uh, on uh, Delancey Street, Grant Street. My father was the manager of a very famous Jewish dairy restaurant called Ratner's Restaurant on Del um, Delancey Street. Blitzes and stuff like that. My parents were Holocaust survivors from Eastern Europe. Uh, went through hiding in the woods, uh, concentration camp, displaced persons camp. And I grew up uh, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, in a home that was filled with uh, despair and loss and grief and death. Uh, death was very real to me as a young child. And, uh, and so uh, I became quite interested in uh, all those topics. Uh, my mother would serve my, my younger brother, Shelley, and, me, and I uh, breakfast in the morning, and she would say, why am I here? Why am I here? And I said, that, uh, egos. <laughs> and she said, no, 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 why am I here and others are not? So I grew up also with this idea of uh, a great deal of survival guilt. My, my parents, uh, uh, my parents, e either verbally or non-verbally, I don't think they actually came out and actually and said it to me, but uh, I certainly got the message growing up that it was uh, it was quite there were, there, that their expectation of me was to achieve something of such significance and impact, particularly in the area of suffering, that it would answer the question. Why did we survive? Why did I survive and others did not? And so it wasn't a coincidence that I ended up at Memorial Sloan Kettering about 33 years ago as a fellow, uh, ostensibly to work with Dr. Jimmy Holland as a mentor, having trained in both medicine and psychiatry, and interested in, superficially interested in the interaction between uh, medical illness and psychiatric, neuropsychiatric complications, uh, I actually ended up there, I realized, uh, about 15 years ago, I ended up there so that I could be at the nexus between life and death, so that I could be at the place where I could most intensely uh, and hopefully successfully explore and understand how a human being can live a mortal, finite life. That's, that's why I was there, and I was uh, fortunate enough to realize that about 15 years ago, and that's when I set upon studying a number of existential concerns, including loss of meaning, and developed meaning-centered psychotherapy. So, uh, to continue in the vein of uh, uh, Ashkenazi Jewish Holocaust survivor eldest sons, I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to quote a, a Talmudic question. The Talmudic question is, "What is truer than the truth?" And the answer is the story. So, this is the story of meaning-centered psychotherapy. 
I do a lot of things at Memorial. I, I've been a psychiatry service chief there for 20, 21, 22 years. Uh, I've uh, been the chairman for the last five years. Uh, started my fellowship there 33 years ago. I headed the fellowship training program for about 15 years. Uh, but about uh, almost 15 years ago, uh, I uh, I set up, I headed up the uh, psychotherapy, psychopharmacology, and system control laboratory, which now split up into two labs. We have about eight laboratories within our department that focus on a variety of different psycho-oncology related issues. So the official name of our laboratory is the labort is the psychotherapy laboratory. The unofficial name of our laboratory is the Laboratory of Despair. Uh, and uh, when I ask audiences to, and it's not, it's we're not the Laboratory of Despair because none of our faculty are able to get NIH grants. We're actually, <laughs> we're actually very successful in that uh, regard. We're very. Uh, more successful than we deserve. Uh, we once prayed for a grant, but it didn't work. So, just to let you know how desperate things can get. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so we called the Laboratory of Despair because we studied, uh, we studied despair. We didn't always study despair. We started out studying major psychiatric disorders, things like uh, depression, anxiety, panic, post-traumatic stress disorder. We developed novel interventions uh, for treatment of all of those issues in the psycho-oncology, the cancer setting. Um, but about 15 years ago, we started to move towards what I call metadiagnostic constructs, study metadiagnostic constructs, issues that related to existential concerns, issues that related to despair. Now, when I ask audiences to yell out, what does despair mean? They always say, loss of hope, diaspora. But um, our definition of despair is related to the French origin of uh, despair, diaspora. Espoir means hope, but espoir, espoir means also breath, inspiration, the es spirit, the essence of who you are. So it's all those constructs that detract from uh, the essence of what makes one human. And as, one, as long as one is being a human, uh, one has meaning. When there is anything that interferes with your ability to continue to be human, uh, with, with all of the existential essential components of that, which I'll talk about in a moment, then uh, one loses a uh, sense of loss of meaning. And there are a lot of other existential uh, concerns that, 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 uh, that populate our, our lives and our experiences as human beings besides uh, meaning. But uh, that's one of the issues that we focused on. We didn't get there directly. We started to do studies uh, in our group of issues like uh, demoralization, loss of dignity, were involved in Harvey Chachanoff's. I helped Harvey. Harvey was my first fellow when I was a, uh, a young attending. And we developed dignity conserving therapy and, and um, did some randomized controlled trials. Uh, we developed new measures and interventions for hopelessness. Uh, but one of the most seminal works was a, a work we did on desire for haste and death. And we did that in both terminally ill AIDS patients because this was going on in the early 90s, mid 90s. Uh, and we did st uh, similar studies of desire for haste and death in terminally ill cancer patients. Now, what we discovered was that if you had unidentified, undiagnosed, untreated depression, you are anywhere between four to seven times more likely to have significant high desire for haste and death. We even developed and validated a, uh, a measure of desire for haste and death called uh, the schedule of attitudes towards haste and death. And this was desire for haste and death that came out of desperation, not an acceptance of death, peaceful acceptance of death. Uh, and <clears throat> besides depression, uh, other factors uh, seem to parent, things like lack of social support, extreme physical debilitation, severe uncontrolled pain, uh, 
when you add it up, dep but depression made up about 45% of the variance. It made up about 45% of, of, the, of the group that uh, predicted the group that uh, had desire for haste and death. Those other factors added another few percentage, so nudged up above 50, 52%. But there's still a, about half the patients who did not quite understand why they had desire for haste and death. So we did some. Uh, some additional studies, and what we discovered was that uh, hopelessness, independent of depression, and loss of meaning were both individually and synergistically significant con contributors to desire for haste and death. Now, when we discovered that depression was a significant uh, correlate uh, or predictor of of the sorrow for haste and death. We actually went about doing several randomized controlled trials in both AIDS and terminally ill cancer patients, looking at what happens to desire for death when you, when you treat depression uh, pharmacologically. As it turns out, if you treat depression pharmacologically in AIDS patients, in cancer patients who have high desire for death and in, who are depressed, the depression resolves, the desire for haste and death resolves about 90%. So when we found that meaning and loss of hope contributed another 40% or so, we then realized that we were confronted with a problem that led to the kind of despair that would lead one to desire for haste and death that we didn't particularly have a treatment for. I must, I'm, I, I'll be honest with you, I went through the PDR. I looked at all 10,000 pages of the PDR. There wasn't a single drug for loss of meaning. If there was a drug, I would have tried it. But we did, so I was forced to consider the possibility of psychotherapy. Now, uh, we developed, as a result of, of, of learning that, we developed the centered psychotherapy. We first set, a, we start, we first set, a, set on a, a course of studies to look at meaning and its impact, uh, importance to patients and its impact on uh, quality of life and other, and other aspects of uh, both physical and psychological well-being. But meaning-centered meaning psychotherapy is heavily influenced by the work of Viktor Frankl and his logotherapy, which I'll tell you quickly about in a moment. But uh, meaning-centered psychotherapy is, is very much a, an existentially oriented psychotherapy. And uh, there are contributions to meaning center psychotherapy, not just from Frankel's work, but from the work of people like Irv Yalom and David Spiegel and David Hussein and other, and other people who, who, uh, who deal with uh, existentially oriented psychotherapies. So there's some basic things that are important to know about human beings in terms of their <laughs> existential nature. Uh, I call this the ontology of oncology. Uh, the first fact, that's, the first thing that's kind of unique about us as human beings is that, uh, and Kierkegaard taught us this about 200 years ago, uh, although it could be 300, because I've been saying 200 for about, a, about 100 years now. <laughs> uh, uh, human beings are the only animals who are aware of their existence. They can objectively contemplate themselves. Some people do the mirror test. If I look in the mirror, you look in the mirror, what do we do? We go, the hair here isn't sticking out a little bit. We, we look at ourselves. Huh? When your dog looks in the mirror, it barks at it, thinks it's another dog. Now, I'm not exactly sure what chimpanzees and orangutans and maybe dolphins do. They might have some brain. But Kierkegaard felt that we were the, we were the only am, animals that uh, had this awareness of our uh, existence and could objectively contemplate ourselves. And as a result of that, he, uh, he postulated that human beings have two emotions as a result of that. The first is awe. Isn't it awesome to be in San Francisco and smell that burning, uh, uh, smoky thing? It's not awesome. Isn't it awesome to be alive and, uh, and dread? the idea that we're mortal, we die. We can die at any moment. <coughs> we can die at any moment. There's a possibility that one of us might not get out of here alive today. 
hopefully it won't, it'll be, it won't be me, but you know, it's a possibility. And then, uh, and then uh, and what the famous uh, social anthropologist Ernest Becker uh, wrote was that in order to deal with death anxiety or death terror, uh, human beings created cultures. And the purpose of culture was to deal primarily with some of the big basic questions human beings have. Where did I come from? What am I supposed to be doing here? Where am I going? Cultures uh, answer those questions. Uh, not surprisingly, most, er, most cultures that started out uh, a long time ago and continue to be part of our, our culture are religions of some sort, right? And, and, uh, and now we have science to explain some of these things. Uh, and so uh, cultures explain where you came from. You know, uh, you were uh, God. God made Adam. He took the rib. He made Eve. You were in the Garden of Eden. That's where you came from. Uh, what am I supposed to do here? You're supposed to pray three times a day. You're supposed to button your clothes this way, that way. You have to wear clothes that don't mix this material with that. You have to eat this food and not that food, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Uh, and where and what, where am I going after all? There's uh, uh, cultures need to provide a literal or metaphorical answer to the question of what happens after death. Now, the other aspect of um, realizing that you exist is the fact that you are then struck with two existential obligations. One is this existential obligation to survive and procreate. I need to survive. And you had a lot of neuroscience uh, uh, grand rounds here in the last few months, I guess. Uh, there are all sorts of systems in your brain that are geared exactly towards making sure you survive. And so survival, your own physical survival, for the purposes probably of procreation, uh, that's one of your the existential obligations. The sex, second existential obligation is what's called responsibility. It's the question of, okay, now that I'm aware that I'm alive, and this usually happens sometimes in childhood, uh, at, at adolescence. For my son Sam, it happened last week. He's 20, 27. Happened last week. But um, for some of us, we haven't quite figured out how it. But uh, so the, uh, the, existential, the, the question is, what is my ability to respond to the fact that I exist? And so your responsibility is to create a life. To create a life. To, to create, to become a who in the world. Hopefully, who you become in the world is reflected by what you do. But you have, have an obligation to create a life, a life that's unique to just you. Oscar Wilde said, live your life. Everyone else's life is taken. You have to live a life to its fullest potential. How many people here have lived their lives to its fullest potential? I'm the only one. It, no, it... it, it it's very, it doesn't happen often. And I'll give you a good example. Most of us don't live to our fullest potential because life is like a trajectory, it's like an arc. When you're writing a play and want to create drama, you, you have the arc of a character and then you have something happen that, that throws that arc off of its course. Boy meets girl, boy falls in love with girl, boy breaks up with girl. Uh, I saw La La Land on the, uh, on the plane, typical uh, example of that. Um, so, um, I'll give you an example. So, when, uh, so uh, most of us don't live to our fullest potential. By not living to our fullest potential, we have what's called existential guilt. That gap between what could have been, what almost should have been, and what will be, that delta is existential guilt. So, when we're talking in palliative care about end of life task completion, or et cetera, we're talking about existential guilt. We're, we're talking about, uh, when, uh, so a good example of this is uh, Albert Einstein on his deathbed. Does anyone know uh, what Albert Einstein's last words were on his deathbed? If only I knew more mathematics. That's Albert Einstein's last words. So Albert Einstein thought, yeah, the theory of relativity was pretty good. A special theory of relativity, that was, that was okay. But if, if I knew a little bit more about mathematics, I could have done something really important. 
And then there's Schindler's List. You know, at the end of Schindler's List, uh, Liam Neeson is sitting there. He's saved two, three hundred Jews from, uh, from death camps. The Russians are coming. And uh, the workers are trying to help him and his wife escape. And he breaks down and he, he, he cries, if only I could have saved one more. You know? So it's the idea that there always could have been more. And of course, if you're 95 years old and you've lived a very full life and you've had a very successful career and you've loved and been loved and you have uh, ch uh, children and grandchildren and lots of friends and, and you've seen the world and all that, you may be facing death with very little regrets and very little undone. But if you're 40 years old and you have uh, advanced pancreatic cancer spread to your liver and you have a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old at home, uh, there's a lot that's not been done. You haven't completed raising your children. You haven't completed fulfilling responsibilities to your family, etc. You haven't quite perhaps done those things with your life and career that you wanted to do. So uh, the amount of existential guilt varies. And of course, um, the other thing that's, that's uh, so you have to create a life that's unique to yourself, that's uh, lived to its full potential, a life of direction, growth, transformation, meaning. Uh, meaning uh, doesn't exist forever. In other words, a meaning has a very short half-life. You may have an experience where you felt your life was meaningful. That doesn't last you your entire life. You have to constantly be creating and recreating meaning and experiencing meaning. And that's, this, and, that's, and that's important because you have to constantly be creating your life and who you are. And the two are inextricably connected. The second unique thing about us is that we are meaning-making creatures, and I'll talk a lot more about that. Uh, the contributions of Viktor Frankl's work in terms of the importance of meaning in human, behavior, uh, human existence as, a, as a, a, uh, a driving force, a motivating force of human behavior and human existence. Uh, the third thing that's important about us is that we're aware that connectedness is essential to our survival and it's the, at the essence of the human experience. And it's not just connectedness to our, the people we love, our immediate uh, family, our immediate, our immediate friends, our, the, the folks who live in our, our town, our cities, our country, whatever. Uh, it's also connectedness to the con continuum of time, the past, present, and future, our ancestors, uh, our descendants, etc. Our history, our story, our his the history, the legacy we are, were given, which we have no choice about, the life that we create in response to that legacy that we're given, and through the life that we create, we've been given uh, the next generational legacy. And there's also the connectedness to something greater than yourself. And that something greater than yourself may be uh, nature, may be beauty, may be love, it may be compassion, it may be generosity, it may be, um, it may be God, it may be, it, it could be love. And then finally, human beings are unique in that we have the ability to uh, transform and grow from events that are tragic. Uh, we're the only animal species that create uh, academic medical centers and cancer centers. Uh, about two blocks down from Sloan Kettering, we have the Animal Medical Center. I walked into the Animal Medical Center and I was shocked. The animals had not created that medical center. It's, it's human beings. So we're the only ones who have that capacity. So we started to look at this idea of being and whether it was important to anyone outside of that little co conference room where the psychotherapy laboratory faculty meets. Uh, and this is some of what we found. One of our fellows, Allison Modell, did a study in about 250 cancer patients, asking them, now that you have cancer, what do you need? 51% said they needed help finding, uh, overcoming fears, 42% finding hope, finding meaning in life, finding peace of mind, finding spiritual resources. So it turns out that our patients are struggling with some of these issues as well, not just us uh, academics who think about these things. 
some people think uh, this, this idea of, uh, of meaning as a, a, an existential component of human existence that comes from existential philosophy. It all came out of Western thought, Western civilization. And the idea of meaning is really just a Western phenomenon. It wouldn't pertain to other cultures in the East or things like that. This talks about the universal, universality of existential suffering. Takahisha Morita. By the way, I try to only reference studies by uh, people I know personally who I'm friends with. If I don't like you, I try not to reference you if I can get away with it. He's a good guy. But, so Takahisha Morita did a study looking at about 160 Japanese cancer patients. Asked them what caused them distress. <coughs> loss of meaning, loss of hope, loss of social role, feeling irrelevance, hopelessness, uh, being a burden to others. One of the things that uh, you'll see in a moment is that there are, there are some predictable, there are about four predictable sources of meaning that help one uh, reconnect, recreate, and experience meaning. And one of those is uh, through, through love, experiential source of meaning through love. And it's the people that you love the most who give your life meaning are also the people who you are concerned when you become ill, you're concerned that your illness will cause stress and despair for them, that you'll become a burden. So when my mom had ovarian cancer about 10 years ago, which she survived, she had surgery uh, at Sloan Kettering, and um, the morning after her surgery, uh, I came to see her. Now, her, now I, I came into the office, I dropped off my, my briefcase and my coat, put on my lab coat. We have to wear white coats to Sloan Kettering. And I walked exactly 300 yards to her room. And I walked in there, and my mother saw me, and she said, oh, you have to bother yourself to come see me? <laughs> so, you know, so the, this burden thing, you know, can get very extreme. It's not, it's not we also started, uh, there also, uh, Maureen Brady and David Sella, who developed the, one of the main tools that we use, assessment measures that we use for meaning, the, uh, the facet spiritual well-being scale, which has a subscale for meaning and a subscale for faith. Um, we see meaning as the secular universal language of existentialism and spiritual. Uh, when you look at patients who have significant pain and significant fatigue, if you're able to sustain a high sense of meaning, you're much more likely to report a very good quality of life than if you have a low sense of meaning with the same level of pain or the same level of fatigue. So it seems like meaning buffers against the distress related to physical symptoms. Uh, faith had a similar but less significant um, impact. Then we started to look at the relationship between spiritual well-being, meaning, and a variety of psychological distress variables. So we looked at depress depressive symptom severity. If you scored really high on the spiritual well-being scale, you had significantly lower uh, uh, severity of depressive symptoms. But what's interesting is that it wasn't the faith uh, subscale of the spiritual well-being score or how religious you considered yourself, how often you, uh, you know, prayed, how, how, how religious you considered yourself. It was whether you were able to sustain a sense of meaning through the course of, uh, of your illness that, that buffered against depression symptom severity. The same thing was true for desire for haste and death, hopelessness, and suicidal ideation. And if you look at this triad of hopelessness, desire for haste and death, and suicidal ideation, you can see that depression is highly correlated with this triad of despair, as I call it, the tragic triad. But meaning is even more significantly related in a negative way to hopelessness, desire for death, haste and death, and suicidal ideation. So we felt, given this data, that if we could develop an intervention that helped sustain or enhance a sense of meaning in patients, we may be able to buffer against depressive symptoms, um, uh, hopelessness, desire for haste and death, improve physical symptom burden distress, 
uh, and, uh, and do all sorts of good things to quality of life in patients with advanced cancer. Uh, this is a study just showing that meaning uh, is an important variable related to distress in, a, in about 62 studies, in a meta-analysis meta of about 62 studies in, uh, in the cancer setting. So we, sh we turn to the work of Victor Frankl. Good. I have run out of time. We, t we, we turn to the work of Victor Frankl. Uh, have, have many of you read uh, Victor Frankl's message for me? Okay. So Victor Frankl was a Viennese psychiatrist. He was not quite a contemporary of Freud. He was a little bit after Freud. He did uh, know Freud. He met Freud. He said Freud some of his early papers. Freud didn't respond to him. Uh, about three years ago, I gave a talk at the first uh, World Congress of, existen of Logotherapy and Existential Analysis. I knew nothing about logotherapy, but apparently I had done the first set of randomized controlled trials of um, meaning-focused uh, meaning psychotherapy in about you know, 80 years or so. Uh, and the, the conference was at the Viennese Medical Library, and I stood at the, at, in, the, in, the in the old auditorium, on the on the stage behind the podium, where where Freud had stood, where Binswanger stood, where uh, uh, Frankel had stood. I stood right there. My feet were exactly where they were, and I felt nothing. I wanted to feel something. Went to the Western Wall, I felt something. But this I didn't feel anything. Victor Frankl was this Viennese psychiatrist. And he was there in the late 30s. In 1939, he was trying to get a visa to leave the country, to go to the United States. He was trying to get a visa for himself, his wife, and his parents. He kept getting refused. One day he gets a phone call from the embassy. The embassy says, good news, we're going to give you and your wife a visa, but we can't give your parents a visa. Stuck, he doesn't know what to do. He has to make a choice. Um, he's walking down the street thinking what he should do. He passes a, a synagogue that's been uh, damaged, desecrated, uh, violence. He sees a piece of granite, he picks it up, and it has Hebrew letters on it. He takes it home, shows it to his father, who is a bit of a Talmudic scholar, and is and he showed it to his father. He said, do you know what this is? He said, yeah, I think I know what this is. Did you, where did you find it? In front of the synagogue. Yeah, I think this is um, a piece of the sculpture of the Ten Commandments that was on the facade of the, uh, of the synagogue. And he said, based on the, the Hebrew letters, I can even tell you which commandment this uh, fragment came from. And he said, which, which, uh, which commandment was it? It was the commandment, honor thy father and mother. Okay. He saw this as an omen. He decided he would not abandon his parents. The result of that was everyone was taken to concentration camp. He was the only one to survive. When he got out of concentration camp, uh, in a period of about four weeks, he wrote Man's Search for Meaning. That's his most famous work. He's written about six other books. I, I, uh, I'd recommend another book called Do The Doctor and the Soul. Uh, but anyway, uh, not for religious reasons. He wasn't, he wasn't particularly religious, uh, Frankl. Uh, but he did participate in Jewish ritual. I had the good fortune to have tea with his wife. And she said to me, he didn't quite believe in God, but he believed in, in putting on, it, it, he believed in uh, Jewish ritual. He thought it connected him to his ancestors and his Jewish roots. Uh, he wrote Man's Search for Meaning in about a period of about four weeks. So the first part of it is his, his survival in camp. The second part is a treatise on his ideas of the importance of meaning uh, in human existence. And there were three basic concepts of, uh, of his that were important. I guess the first one I want to focus on is the fact that the need or desire to find or create or experience meaning in human existence is a basic primary motivating force of human behavior. Uh, he compared it to things like libido and will to power. He didn't think uh, that uh, the, the need to find or create or experience meaning was, uh, was as basic 
uh, as libido in terms of being an instinct, he thought it was meta-instinctual. It was a construct, not a, not a reflexive, unconscious construct, but more something that involved the higher uh, cortical areas of our brain. The second important concept was that life has meaning and never ceases to have meaning from the first moment of life to the last moment of life. Meaning in life may change over the course of your life, but your life never ceases to have meaning. It's a little bit like if you lose your car keys, they don't cease to exist. You just have to find them. Now, I some, when I used to lecture years ago, I, I would say, so when I was a baby and I needed my mother to change my diaper and lift me from the crib to the high chair and feed me, my life had meaning. Now, standing in front of you lecturing, chairman of this or that, I, my life has meaning. Uh, 30 years from now, I want a patient at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and the nurse needs, and the nurse's aide needs to change my diaper, and they need to lift me from the bed to the chair and feed me, and my life will have meaning. Meaning my life will, will change, but it will always exist. It's a little bit dogmatic, because the fact of the matter is, how many of you have lost car keys and just never found them? So you have to, what do you have to do? You have to get new car keys. You have to recreate it. And the fact is, as a baby, uh, I didn't know I had meaning. There might have been my parents. I, was, I, I contributed to the meaning in life of my parents, but I myself didn't experience meaning. I, don't, I didn't have the cognitive abilities or the developmental abilities. So we've modified that because uh, we thought it was a bit dogmatic. We've modified it in the following way. We've modified it to really focusing on the fact that the possibility of creating or experiencing meaning exists always until the last moments of sentient life. There may be a point where you get too demented to that, but with a patient, for instance, who's too demented as brain metabolism, you won't be able to do many uh, standard psychotherapy. But the fact is that um, meaning because it ha it's, a, it's a commodity, the, the, the belief, the experience, the that you, your life, that you have a sense that your life has meaning, right? Uh, that exists for just so long, and then you have to recreate it and re-experience it as you go on in life. And the fact that it, that it is something that needs to be renewed constantly also makes it something that is amenable towards an intervention, especially when you confront obstacles or limitations that, it, that then produce a loss of meaning, right? Anything that takes away the essence of who you are as a human being, any limitation, profound sense of loss of meaning. And then finally, we have the freedom to choose what we find meaning in and to choose the attitude that we take towards how we respond to any limitation, any uncertainty, how we respond to suffering. Carl Jasper is called suffering any human beings encounter with limitations. And so cancer, illness, death is, provides a lot of limitations. Death is the ultimate limitation. Frankel also taught us that there are some ex uh, easily accessible sources of meaning in life. Now the fact of the matter is, is that most of us go around every day living very meaningful lives, but we just don't know it. Okay? And we don't do it intentionally. Right? You don't get up in the morning and turn to your wife or husband or partner and say, okay, now I'm going to engage in some uh, in an experiential source of meaning through love by uh, hugging my partner and kissing them and telling them I love them and, and, and you know you don't, you don't do that intentionally you know then just don't go in the other room and go I'm going to go you know snuggle with the kids and they make them breakfast but I want to have another you know I want to have a source I want to get some more meaning in my life through, uh, through love and legacy and all that creates and things like that. And then you don't rush out of the thing with the coffee in your hand and the car to go to work because I'm gonna, now I'm going to go to work because I want to have another meaningful uh, experience through uh, creating my, who I am in the world and, and through my work and dedication. You don't do that intentionally. Uh, and the essence of meaning science psychotherapy is to, is uh, in, the, in the aftermath of having a cancer diagnosis and in the aftermath of having a life-limiting cancer uh, diagnosis, uh, 
you lose, you, uh, your world is hit by a tornado, and it turns out to be very helpful to A, reinforce and make more conscious, bring to conscious awareness t two things. One, that meaning, sustaining meaning, is very important in terms of allowing you to go through this cancer experience uh, uh, with less depression, less hopelessness, uh, better quality of life, etc. And two, there are predictable, specific sources of meaning that you can reach for to re as resources to sustain or enhance your sense of meaning. So Frankl really focused on two sources of meaning, love and work. Uh, love is really what's called the experiential sources of meaning. The way your life is imbued with meaning through experiencing life with all of your senses and emotions. The French word for meaning is sens, sense. So through love, through 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 uh, through nature, art, beauty, relationships, etc. Right? All the ex feeling fully alive. It's all of your senses, all your experiences. Love is meaning. Second source of meaning is through dedicating to yourself to something that you care about to create who you are in the world. The creative sources of meaning. Creative sources of meaning are all the ways in which your life is imbued with meaning through the process of creating who you become and you continue to become uh, in, in the world. Irv Yalom just released a new book called Becoming Myself. It's the story of his life. Re uh, real sort of concrete recognition that he understood that he was becoming Irvi Hallam for about 89 years. Third source of meaning is the is the notion that you have the, that you can derive meaning through uh, choosing how you respond to uh, suffering, existential problems, limitation, uncertain future. There are two kinds of future, a certain future and uncertain future. The certain future is mundane, as completely non-unique, it has nothing to do with you as an individual. You're born, you live, you die. Or in the case of Socrates, you're born, you think, you die. Right? You can't change it. Everyone really has an uncertain future. Right? And the uncertain future is the only type of future that allows you to take part in creating that future. It's the only future in which you have agency in creating that future. And so by creating, by choosing the attitude you take towards suffering, you are creating your future. And, you are, and your attitude is part of who you are as a person, it's the, your perspective on the world, and it's it's made up of your attitudes and perspective, which is which are the elements of who you are. So it's related to creative sources of meaning. And then finally, meaning exists in a historical context. Uh, um, Frankel really didn't talk about meaning, uh, historical uh, or legacy as a specific source of meaning, but we we elevated legacy to a source of meaning. The legacy that you're given, which you have no choice in, the genes, the parents you're born into, the the, the epoch of the earth, uh, whether you're born in Mumbai or San Francisco or New York, uh, the genes that you inherit, etc. You're given all of this. What you're given. You have no choice about it, but you do have a choice in how you respond to what you've been given. And so that life that you create is your choice, the choice that you have the choice in creating your own life. And that life is your living legacy, the legacy you live, and that's the legacy you leave behind. There are three main avenues of leading up to meaning fulfillment. The first way is to work. Through creating a work or doing a deed. Second, through love, through experiencing someone in his very uniqueness, and this means loving. Work and love are the main avenues leading up to meaning. But, in, if need be, if you are confronted with a fate you no longer can change, same with an incurable disease, with an inoperable cancer. Even then you may find a meaning. 
you may even find the deepest possible, the highest conceivable meaning, because you then have an opportunity to bear witness of the human potential at its best, which is to turn your predicament into an achievement on the human level, to turn a tragedy into a personal triumph. There are three. So we developed, me, uh, we developed me in a psychotherapy. It's very much a, uh, it's a, it's a limit, it's a, it's a limit uh, structured uh, psychotherapy. Uh, some people don't even like calling it a psychotherapy. They call it a counseling intervention. Um, but it's didactic and experiential. The first component of all the sessions are some didactic components. Uh, introduce first in the first session introductions and introduction to the idea of the definition of meaning, the sources of meaning, and the experiential exercise about meaning so that patients can learn what we mean about meaning, the sources of meaning. And we try to write through each of the narratives that come out of the stimulus question. Uh, we, ex the facilitators or therapists, ex explicate uh, that's a, a creative source of meaning, that's an attitudinal source of meaning. Have a patient who described the sources of meaning as like a, a four drawer dresser in his room, in his bedroom. He said, You wake up in the morning and, and like all of your clothes are in a big jumble on the floor. And it's really helpful to know that in this drawer are my, my socks, in this room my underwear, there's my t shirts, etc. Uh, so we knew, you know, we did this in a very empirical fashion. We, we, we looked at all of the psychotherapies that existed up until that time, it was in the, around 2000. Most of them had been done in women with breast cancer, for instance, and it was Spiegel's Supportive Expressive Psychotherapy, which is a year long. We said, nah, we don't want to, we don't want to do anything that's a year long. Uh, Fauci Fauci and the UCLP, like a 12 week uh, psychoeducational intervention for melanoma patients. Now, that's more like it. So we knew we needed a first session and a last session. That was, we knew. And then we wanted to have sessions that focused on each source of meaning. We first started out with a group set, a group format and then eventually adapted an individual format and uh, tested that as well, randomized tr controlled trials. So we knew we needed to have a first session, a last session, and uh, f uh, sessions that focused on four of the source, all four sources of meaning. Because it was a group and it was about six or eight people, uh, the experiential exercises ask about, you know, what, tell us the story of your name, tell us the story about your family, you know, you know, stuff like that. What are your most important accomplishments, etc. So we have two sessions for that. And we knew we needed to have a linking session. We figured we needed a linking session between meaning and cancer. And so we did that through a, um, an, an exercise on identity. You know, our identity, but who answered the question, who am I before the cancer? Answer it now. What's really interesting <coughs> is that when you think of identity and you think about roles, there are two ways in which you can think about your identity and roles that, that provide your life meaning. Uh, roles might be things that you actually do, or they might be things that you be, <laughs> that you are, right? Uh, and sometimes they're so intertwined, it's a little hard to tell the difference. Uh, but for instance, I'll give you an example. There was a, there was a patient who was uh, a 40, 40 something year old man, and it's exactly like the one I, I talked about a moment ago, who, whose most, most important thing in his life, uh, the thing that gave his life more meaning was his, uh, his son and his identity as being a father. And what allowed him to feel like a father was going to the backyard with his son on football Sundays and throwing a football with him. The fatigue and the ravages of his cancer, he couldn't do that anymore. And he didn't feel like a father anymore. And one of the members of the group said, what the heck's the matter with you? She, 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 he said, what are you talking about? She said, my father never threw a football with me, and he was a fantastic father. Why don't you take your son, sit on the couch with him, watch TV, hold him, pull him near you, tell him how much you love him, tell him your hopes and dreams for him, right? Tell them how proud you are. That's what being a father is, not throwing a football. So it's a technique that we use, because this comes up a lot with actions and limitations, moving from ways of doing to ways of being. Uh, and so, uh, and, and in the middle there, we threw in a legacy project. We gave patients uh, copies of Man's Search for Meaning in the beginning. Some of them read it, some of them didn't. 
But subsequently, uh, these are some of the experiential questions that are stimulus questions that are used in the ex uh, stimulus questions that are used in the experiential uh, exercises. Uh, list a few experiences, moments in life where, where you felt fully alive. Uh, uh, this is the identity exercise. Uh, his, historical context of life, the legacy you're given, the legacy you live, the legacy you leave behind. Uh, the uh, attitudinal uh, sources of meaning, we focus on limitations and the finiteness of life. And this is where we talk a little bit about death and what a meaningful death would be. Existential guilt. Uh, we talk, uh, creative sources of meaning through responsibility, unfinished business. That's where we deal with uh, existential guilt a lot. Uh, by that, by this time, we've already got, you know, each session focuses on source of meaning, but it also gives you the facilitator opp opportunities to say, oh, you know, that's a creative source of meaning, up to the point where patients become very familiar with these sources of meaning that become facile in using it. So the objective is, ah, meaning is really important as I go through this cancer journey, and I have all of these resources to help me sustain a sense of meaning. And by the time you get to session seven, there it talks about love up for love and nature and art and beauty a lot. And in the last session, which we originally called termination, and one of my uh, research <laughs> research assistants said, Bill, I don't think you should call it termination. You know, and so we changed it. But you can see here, uh, this I, I didn't correct that on the slide. Uh, and uh, it's an exercise of hopes for the future. So uh, in, in that regard, uh, well, what was the experience of the, in the group like for you, and especially what impact did it have on you in regards to this whole idea of meeting and uh, being in life? Well, that's a, that's a very difficult question. And I, you know from the other meetings I do my homework, and I read the material over and I went through it again yesterday and again today uh, in terms of the meaning aspects to so, it. Uh, in, in that vein, I think it did bring me to realize that what was the experience in the group life for you made me sure that that would have in regards as a result of the meaning and health problems uh, and that being a better so uh, in, in that regard, uh, sorry, what, so, that's good. what was the experience of being in the group like for you, and especially what impact did it have on you in regards to the idea of meeting in, uh, meeting in life? Well, that's a, that's a very difficult question. And I do you know from the other meetings I do my homework, and I read the material over, and I went through it again yesterday and again today uh, in terms of the meaning aspects to it. And I think it did bring me to realize that life is finite. It may be shortened as a result of the health problems. And that being a better person and enjoying what you have is important. Now, can I bring myself to do that? That's another question. Uh, I'm going to try. Uh, I've been going to temple more frequently than I did in the past. I can't say that that's a result of one thing or another, but I think maybe more of the illness. And I had a, my grandfather used to go to the temple every single Saturday, no matter what. So I, I kind of visualize him at the Orthodox Synagogue. We belong to um, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. But I think the, I, I think the sessions were exceedingly valuable. Uh, I would say they transcended me. Did you hear that last part? Uh, you used the uh, uh, you used the word transcendent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The transcendent meaning. Transcendent meaning. Did I use that word? Yes. I didn't even know I used that. You said it. the group transcendent meaning. I didn't know I didn't, know, I, I didn't even know the word. We love that word. I love that word. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a sense of what you're talking about? Here? 
story because uh, I can't believe I'm almost done and, and, and it's not 9.30. <laughs> but uh, this idea of transcendence, uh, is it, uh, does anyone really understand it? Yeah, me neither. I didn't understand what, you know, it felt a little too new agey. Now maybe in California this is, oh my, but in New York. So uh, I was in JFK. And uh, I said to myself, okay, there are ascending escalators. I know what those are. Those are the escalators that take you up. I know what descending escalators are. They're the escalators that take you down. So where are the transcending escalators? By the way, when I arrived in, the, in your airport in San Francisco, there's a yoga room. Did you know that? Okay. I, I was there for about an hour. Anyway, so... So I said, where are the transcending escalators? Does anybody know? Yes, yeah, so those walkways, right? It's those walkways that take you to all the different gates. And I, I, on my way here, I go, wow, Santiago, Chile, Paris, oh, um, Detroit. <laughs> but it, is, it, it takes you out. It takes you up. It connects you from where you are above and to other places, right? So transcendence is not just about sort of overcoming something, right? It's not necessarily that spirit necessarily spiritual, but it is spiritual in the sense of it's existential in the sense of connection. You, you find some co connectivity to something greater than yourself, something outside of yourself. And that's transcendence. So this is the Grand Rounds in a very prestigious institution. I did four randomized controlled trials, all funded by the National Cancer Institute. Uh, two in uh, individual mini-centered psychotherapy, two in uh, uh, mini-centered group psychotherapy. And what we found was that mini-centered psychotherapy in both group and individual formats enhances spiritual well-being, uh, most profoundly meaning, a little bit of faith, enhances quality of life, it decreases hopelessness, desire for haste and death, it, it, it decreases physical symptom burden distress. Remember that set of studies I showed you, but meaning was related? Uh, decreases depression, decreases anxiety. And it's all mediated through enhancing meaning. That's the paper we, we just got, we're just uh, publishing. So, uh, so the mechanism is through the enhancement of meaning. That is the mediating factor. And these papers are appear in, uh, uh, I, I tried to get as many of these papers in oncology journals so that I can get promoted in my own cancer center. <laughs> and, uh, and for our cancer center uh, uh, core grant renewal. So they're in psychology, but mainly in the journal of clinical oncology, although 
our, uh, we're trying to get our individual randomized controlled trial uh, published in JAMA Psychiatry. In fact, the National Cancer Institute designated meaning-centered group psychotherapy as a research test intervention for palliative care, actually. And so if you go to this website, I don't know if you guys can see it, you can download all of the manuals, all of the papers, all of our data, uh, all of our measures, everything. So we're very proud of that. And individual meaning center psychotherapy is being evaluated for that right now. And there are two uh, manuals that we publish, both uh, individual and group manuals. They're available on uh, Amazon and Kindle and stuff like that. And uh, in January, we published a textbook of meaning centered psychotherapy. It has uh, several chapters, has 15 chapters, uh, several chapters that focus on the existential theoretical framework of, of uh, meaning centered psychotherapy, and then chapters on meaning centered, on individual group meaning centered psychotherapy. And we've been very, very busy trying to uh, actually adapt and study, uh, adapt and, and study and randomize trials, adaptations of meaning centered psychotherapy for other purposes in other populations. So uh, we've, we've adapted meaning centered psychotherapy as a bereavement intervention for parents who've lost a child to cancer. Uh, we've adapted meaning centered psychotherapy as an intervention for breast cancer survivors. We've adapted meaning centered psychotherapy as an intervention for cancer caregivers. Uh, bless you. Uh, our colleagues in the Netherlands have, uh, have done randomized controlled trial of meaning centered group psychotherapy for general cancer survivors. Uh, our, our pediatric psycho oncology group is studying meaning centered psychotherapy for adolescents and young adults. Um, uh, Lise Fillon in Canada did meaning centered psychotherapy for hospice nurses. Uh, Jess Winger at Duke is. Uh, uh, with Frank Keith is doing many centered psychotherapy uh, coping for pain uh, with his care ward. And there are replication studies now going on in Portugal, Italy, Netherlands, Spain, Israel, Taiwan. Uh, the manuals are now translated into uh, several languages, Japanese, Korean, Portuguese, Spanish, things like that. Uh, we've also done uh, cultural and linguistic adaptations of meaning centered psychotherapy for Mandarin speaking Chinese immigrants in New York and uh, Spanish speaking uh, Caribbean uh, uh, Latin American uh, immigrants to New York. We were in our third year of a five year uh, National Cancer Institute uh, training grant, an R25 training grant. We just had a training. Uh, last week, Thursday and Friday, 25 clinicians from around the country and, and uh, internationally as well. I think at this point we've trained about 250 uh, uh, people, a two-day intensive course free with a $500 travel stipend. Um, we, use, we have a communication skills training laboratory in which we have very talented actors who play patients who teach, we, we do uh, communication training to all the fellows, oncology fellows, surgeons, et cetera, in Sloan Kettering, and doing other types of uh, uh, communications training as well. And so we use actors to simulate patients, and so it's a, it's a combination of um, uh, lectures, experiential exercises, and time practicing meaning centered psychotherapy with, uh, with uh, with simulated patients, patients and a facilitator like myself telling you, no, you did that wrong, or you did this the way, this the way to do it, things like that. Uh, and let me finish. Today, uh, today, today uh, hair of my age, I started taking flying lessons recently. Do you know what my flying instructor told me? If you are starting here, wish to get here, say east, heading for this, and you have a crosswind, you will drift and you will land here, so you have to do what we pilots call a crabbing, he told me, C-R-A-B, crabbing. You have to head for north of this airfield. If you are heading here above this airfield, then you will actually land here. But if you have for here, you are landing here. 
Like people were looking for something to find meaning in life. In Mexico, in Guadalajara, 10,000 people, only young people. Mother Therese spoke, and, and after Mother Therese, he gave a lecture and approximately 10,000 people. If we, if we take man as he really is, we make him worse. But if we overestimate him, Premature your applause, you will soon know why. If we, if we seem to be idealists and are overestimating, overrating man, and looking at him that high, here above, you know what happens? We promote him to what he really can be. So we have to be idealists in a way, because then we uh, wind up as the true, the real realists. And you know who has said this? If we take man as he is, we make him worse. But if we take man as he should be, we make him capable of becoming what he can be. This was not my flight instructor, this was not me, this was Goethe. He said this verbally. So I show you this last clip for three obvious reasons. <clears throat> One was just, uh, you know, What's the grand rounds without mentioning Goethe? <laughs> right? 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 right. I mean, how many grand rounds have you had where that didn't come up? Uh, the, se <laughs> the second was the order of speakers. That was Ellie. His, his, uh, af after the war, he, he continued to work out as, as a psychiatrist, and all the Viennese psychiatrists were neurologists and psychiatrists. Interestingly, uh, Frankel's earlier work before, uh, uh, um, before the Holocaust was uh, uh, drilling, uh, uh, treating depression by uh, drilling, doing a little craniotomy and inserting a catheter into the main ventricle and injecting cocaine as a treatment of depression. It was highly effective. <laughs> it didn't catch on, but it was a highly effective. Uh, so that was Ellie. And so she was talking about the order of speakers, and I just wanted to imprint that order of speakers on you. First, Mother Teresa spoke, then Victor Frankl spoke, and now I'm speaking. You know, so it's just like... <laughs> And then the, the last thing I wanted to convey is the idea that um, even in the last months of life, there is the potential for impacting the lives of patients in very positive ways through all sorts of interventions, all sorts of, uh, including psychotherapy. When I started to work at Memorial as a fellow 33 years ago, the dogma was uh, basically, for patients who are dying, your role as a psychotherapist, a uh, mental health provider, a psychiatrist, whatever, uh, is to uh, provide support and uh, the support and non-abandonment. Be there on it. Uh, what about the possibility of change, Jimmy? I would ask that to him. Almost all of all, all of my basically all of my research endeavors came out of responses to questions I asked Dr. Holland. Dr. Holland, why do patients on steroids develop all of these neuropsychiatric disorders? Uh, I'll tell you the truth, Bill, I don't know. I guess you'll have to go figure that one out yourself. You know, so then I went and I did a, a few studies on that. Uh, pain, pain and AIDS, I don't think people with AIDS have pain. Yeah, they do. Oh, well, if you want to waste your time studying, you know, so, so, uh, when it came to death, uh, the idea was, you know, the dogma was, if you're a son of a bitch when you're living, you die a son of a bitch. So there's no possibility for change at the near the end of life. Uh, and so, uh, and when and when my first uh, study of uh, meaning centered psychotherapy restar research council, uh, the physician in chief of the hospital at the time, who didn't last very long, but. Uh, uh, he was the head of the research council at that time, and he, I, I was not at the research council, but I, it was the comment was a little bit like that moron comment of Mr. You know, I heard about it later. You know. uh, uh, the physician chief said, "Can our patients die unhappy?" 
You know, isn't that allowed? So I guess the, the, the last uh, reason to show you that clip was to urge you to be idealists and to look for the best in our patients. Thank you very much. I don't have the microphone, but I think we'll go ahead and take some questions. The last few minutes that we have. <laughs> so, um, Kind of reductionist and practical question, which is um, in, in light of uh, the uplifting nature of your talk. Um, so, th th I just want to hear more about the shift from thinking about group psychotherapy to individual psychotherapy. Um, you know, from a practical standpoint, if it works very well in your groups, particularly in your setting, that would seem like an ideal way to disseminate something um, and scale it. Uh, and I wonder whether it was just that there are certain people who don't do well in groups, or whether or not you feel like there's a particular additional benefit to having people in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Uh, thank you for that question. This is obviously a question from someone who knows how, how messy science can be, <laughs> all right? So we started out doing group, a group uh, intervention. Um, you know, when we start to do the, um, the, all of the various adaptations of meeting center psychotherapy, we actually went about it in an empirical fashion. We did focus groups. We, 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 uh, you know, we tried to collect as much data as we possibly could to deliver an intervention that was, uh, that we thought had a high likelihood of success and that was it going to be feasible, acceptable to patients. One of the things that we determined, for instance, in doing the, means, uh, the adaptation for meaning centered grief therapy was patients didn't want to come back to Memorial Sloan Kettering. So it's an internet-based um, virtual intervention, uh, individual, right? Uh, same thing with caregivers. You know, they don't have time to leave the bedside, things like that. Uh, so with our set of studies, we, we weren't that empirical, you know, we made decisions without a lot of information. But we started out with group, uh, a group form because that was the prevailing format of most psychotherapies <laughs> in, in the oncology setting in those days. Uh, you know, especially with the impact of uh, David Spiegel's work, uh, especially the, the buzz that was created around the idea that you could actually enhance survival, for instance, with support. So, um, so we just went to group psychotherapy, a group format, because that was the standard of the time. But in doing the, the first trial, uh, we, did two, we did two trials. One was a smaller trial with about 125 people. The second one was a larger randomized trial with, uh, uh, with um, 350 or so patients. Uh, we kept improving the methodology of the trials. We, you know, we always compared meaning center psychotherapy with a, a structured uh, intervention, like you know, supportive psychotherapy. Um, and we, we didn't start out uh, sort of requiring a certain level of distress or loss of meaning before entry into the initial trials. We started to do that. Uh, one of the problems with dignity conserving therapy is that we weren't able to demonstrate significant effects on the primary outcome measures in dignity conserving therapy because folks had, they, they, did, they, weren't, they didn't have that much loss of dignity to begin with, so you didn't have a lot of room to improve. Uh, so subsequent trials where people are in more distress will show some effects. So we improved things as we went along. But what we found doing the groups was that it's really hard when you're dealing, we were, we were focusing on patients with solid tumors, stage three or four, primarily stage four cancers, about 75% of the participants had stage four solid tumors, solid cancers. Uh, what we found was very hard to get everybody together on Wednesday at three o'clock in the afternoon for an hour and a half. We'd have a lot of attrition, we'd have people who get sick, there'd be people who get stuck with chemo. So um, it was the problem of attrition, the problem of flexibility. Uh, so 
I remember thinking we got to we have to find some way to do something a little bit more flexible, and that's when we decided uh, let's try to do an individual format. Now I wanted to do an individual format. Uh, Adapted for for a couple of years, but there's nothing like getting a grant from a, uh, from a big grant from a foundation to get you started. So uh, we got a big grant from the Cornfell Foundation, which helped us adapt it, and then we got the NCI funding to do the trials. Uh, and the individual format allowed for more flexibility. You know, if something's not feeling well, you can do it next week or the next day. You can actually do it at the bedside. Um, so it allowed for more flexibility and more depth, more intensity. But you're absolutely correct. There is something magical about a group, the group process. And if you look at our individual studies, what, there are some differences. And we're in the process now of looking at a whole big database of all of the, very, all the, all the patients who, who participate in all the trials uh, to see what, you know, what are the predictors of who will do best in a group, who will do best individually, who does best with the therapy in general, et cetera. But uh, as it turns out, the group, the, 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 the effect size of, on the outcomes for group is slight, slightly bigger than the individual. And the benefits actually last a little bit longer and actually keep going up for some reason. Uh, and the individual still thankfully seen effects, but uh, they're not quite the size of the group, and they, they, they kind of peter a little bit uh, towards the end. So there are some actual differences, and I think it has something to do with uh, the group process. And of course, we, we were quite rigorous in how we did the trials. You know, we did the trial the way you would do a, a psychopharmacology trial. You know, we did treatment adherence and treatment integrity ratings. Uh, we, you know, we did it with two-way mirrors and things like that, trained people. Um, we had a, a, a relatively large, diverse group of, uh, of, of therapists, um, uh, you know, so that we could, you know, it wasn't just me doing media center psychotherapy, um, you know, these people. So it was. Uh, so we had social workers. We had pre-doctoral students. We had post-doctoral students. We had psychiatrists. We had psychologists. Junior, senior, etc. Um, we even had uh, a couple. We had. We had uh, I mentioned social workers. Yeah. We even had uh, some nurse practitioners uh, lead some of the groups. So uh, there's some diversity there. But that's how we did that. You're next. So. What I'm wondering is, um, I see the outcome in your studies, but I'm wondering how outcome expectations, they're inconsistent often in the course of therapy, how that is presented to patients of what their yeah. expectations may be of this intervention. Right. Well, I'm going to answer it, and then you'll have this. Okay. So don't, don't ask your question yet. So I'll, I'll ask your question. So um, you have to be really care, careful about that, right? Uh, so, um, initially, in one of our first, uh, when we first did the first draft of our RRB protocol you know, to, to recruit patients for uh, means of group psychotherapy, um, we realized, you know, when you look at the, when you look at what we, we've written, you know, we kind of say, do you want to be, do you want to be in, in our, do you want to receive our novel new meaning center psychotherapy or traditional support? <laughs> <laughs> no, so you can. <laughs> so uh, believe it or not, you know, in the, in the title of the of the study too is it critical. You know, it's the title of the study is meaning center psychotherapy for advanced cancer patients, and the patient gets support psychotherapy. Go with me. I don't get. It's it's like when someone's getting a you know a, a chemotherapy clinical trial. You know they want to they want to they want the placebo. You know, and we're not giving them placebo. We're actually giving the, stand, the standard of care. And I must tell you, uh, in in uh, some of our trials, the support of psychotherapy arm, well, the support of psychotherapy arm did very well. People did very well. They improved quite a bit. You know, thankfully, for the for the outcomes that we were focused on, uh, um, meaning sense of psychotherapy uh, was significantly better uh, because of its focus on meaning, and um, 
but the supportive, uh, supportive psychotherapists, uh, the ones who did, the, you know, did a structured group. Uh, so, uh, we had a manual for supportive psychotherapy group, group psychotherapy. We had a structured manual for individual supportive psychotherapy. And then we had, on our last trial, three arms, uh, 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 mini-centered, individual mini-centered psychotherapy, individual support, and uh, enhanced usual care. So, uh, so in the titles of the protocols, it just says uh, supportive psychotherapy interventions for cancer patients, right? To try to, to try to not bias folks against it. And uh, we also did ask patients their preference, you know? And then if they didn't get their preference or not, you know, what, what the impact was. Most of, um, so uh, most of the time, actually, when people didn't get their preference, they either dropped out, you know? So there's a little bit of selection bias in there, obviously. And then, um, or they took the support arm, for instance, or the mini center arm, and they, and they, and they were, they felt good about the choice. So you have to be careful about that. Yes, your question. Yeah. Oh, okay, so I'll, you can ask my question.